It is my distinct pleasure and honor to introduce uh, Honorable Zaid Rad Al Hussein as our distinguished lecturer today. He has been a uh, diplomat, an advocate for human rights, and public intellectual, and excelled in all of these roles, always serving for the public, for the globe, for the greater good, for humanity. Born in Amman, Jordan, he was uh, educated in the UK and in the US, earning a bachelor's degree from the Johns Hopkins University and a PhD in history from Cambridge University. He then served as an officer in the Jordanian Desert Police for five years and spent two years as a political affairs officer for UN Profor, the uh, United Nations force in the former Yugoslavia, uh, before starting his diplomatic career. And then he uh, went on to have a long and impressive career as a diplomat, representing his country, Jordan, serving twice as Jordan's ambassador to the United Nations and once as Jordan's ambassador to the United States. And in this capacity, in these capacities, uh, he made many important contributions, especially to the United Nations in multiple areas, uh, working to prevent the spread of nuclear materials uh, to the hands of extremists, leading the efforts at eliminating sexual exploitation and abuse in UN peacekeeping operations, and taking charge in creating the International Criminal Court, ICC, and serving as the first president of the governing body of the ICC in 2002 uh, to guide the court's growth in its first three years, from 2002 to 2005. Uh, then we probably all know him uh, as the UN High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, for that role, he served from 2014 to 2018. And during his tenure as High Commissioner, he brought his principled approach to the office and tackled a growing number of human rights challenges about which we will hear from him today. And I have heard from many people in the human rights community that he is the best high commissioner that we have had, all, with all due respect to other high commissioners, uh, in that he is the most fearless of all the high commissioners we have had, always speaking truth to power, holding perpetrators accountable, even those that have enormous power and influence in the United Nations and international politics, such as leaders of China, Russia, and the United States. And for all his excellent work on behalf of human rights, he has received many recognitions, uh, such as the Stockholm Human Rights Award in 2015 and the Foreign Policy's uh, Career Diplomat of the Year Award in 2018. And he has been working increasingly as a public intellectual as well, currently holding the position of the Perry World House Professor of the Practice of Law and Human Rights at the University of Pennsylvania. And he was recently inducted into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. We are privileged to have him here today as a distinguished speaker to share his experiences and visions for the future of human rights in the world. So without any further ado, please join me in welcoming Honorable Zaid Al Hussein. Thank you, uh, Professor Tatsui, for those very kind remarks. I'm delighted to be here at Michigan at the Donia Center to speak about the global challenges to uh, human rights today. And I thank all the sponsors that you enumerated on your list. And I'm delighted to see my uh, good friend and also colleague, Jared, uh, Jared Ganser, for having facilitated uh, this uh, lecture this evening. I must say, listening to uh, Professor Tatsui uh, recall my background is uh, a mildly refreshing experience uh, because when I was at the UN, um, people were confused about who I was. I was referred to as uh, Zaid Wright, which is my name that I've used most often, but also Zaid Wright Zaid and Zaid Wright Zaid Al Hussein. And uh, it sowed considerable um, uh, confusion at levels with the UN where people had to send me notes and didn't know how to address me. Uh, 
uh, until we reached a point where I was in Brussels just before a, a press conference and a young Danish journalist came up to me and tapped me on the shoulder and she said to me, uh, who are you? And I looked at her and I said, do you know, I have no clue anymore. <laughs> so, so it's good to have uh, one's memory refreshed. So what are universal human rights? Well, in a simplistic form, they are the rights enumerated in the uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights, uh, and then uh, rights codified in two, the two great covenants, and altogether expressed in nine core treaties, and then a handful of additional uh, protocols to those treaties. The rights basically uh, that are expressed promote um, or let's say the, the core treaties promote uh, rights, uh, the rights of uh, ch the child, the rights of persons with disabilities, and they of course also prohibit violations of those rights, uh, such as uh, racial discrimination, um, the uh, discrimination against women in forced disappearances and torture. And when a state ratifies a particular instrument or accedes to a treaty, it takes on the obligations enumerated in those um, treaties. The monitoring of those treaties then is done by a group of experts and independent experts included who investigate and uh, then draw conclusions as to compliance. There is a Human Rights Council comprised of uh, 47 states and a universal peer review uh, mechanism that's in its third cycle. And all of this is centered in Geneva, where my old office also is there, that provides an independent commentary on the um, compliance by state actors. Uh, all of this uh, then links into regional rights mechanisms, such as the Inter-America Commission, uh, or the Inter-America Court, the Court, the European Court in Strasbourg, and sometimes the European Court in, uh, of, in, in Luxembourg as well. You also have a, um, a network of national human rights institutions, uh, human rights commissions, ombuds, um, ombudsman's offices, and all of that forms part of the machinery. And this at the sharp end then connects with the frontline human rights defenders that are the real heroes of the human rights story, journalists, lawyers, and activists uh, working to ensure that uh, states abide by their obligations. So uh, the next question one has to ask is, uh, are human rights a weak force or a strong force? And on the face of it, you'd have to believe that they're a weak force. The mere fact that most universities don't have human rights centers and if they have un uh, human rights centers, they're small, uh, often underfunded, usually lodged in a law faculty, and even there they struggle to find a position of prominence. Um, and if you look then, uh, uh, continue to look at the world of academia and look at the corpus of literature on economics, or let's say, uh, development economics, or look at political science literature, you hardly ever come across those two words, human rights. And don't even get me started on business literature. Shh, shh, for God's sakes, don't mention human rights. Huh? Don't mention those two words. You know, we'll annoy China, we'll annoy Saudi Arabia, we'll annoy United Arab Emirates. We lose our funding, we lose our opportunities, we lose our grant, we lose access. So whatever we do, we don't mention those two words. If we have to say anything, we look at subcategories of rights and we talk about uh, these uh, issues in euphemistic language. We'll talk about harmony, we'll talk about inclusive economies, we'll talk about gender mainstreaming but never those two words, and Voldemort would be so proud. <laughs> so why, why then are they so terrified, right? Is it not because, simply put, constitutions confer legitimacy on governments, 
right? Propped up by elections and the certification of that legitimacy comes later. It comes where at a time when peoples can make determinations as to whether the government stays or not, but it also comes when the human rights machinery certifies that a government is actually serving its people and not the other way around. And for that reason, it is extremely powerful. When I was High Commissioner, yes, I would be promoting and defending human rights, but in a very real sense, I was also exercising raw political power because I was in that space and we were all in that space between and separating a government from its people. And that's why it's so powerful. And it is an enigma that it isn't more prominent when it comes to the disciplines and the structures that I was explaining earlier. So what are the mo main threats to human rights today? There are nine of them that I see. The main threat to the architecture that we've put in place comes from China. China simply does not want to be constrained, does not want to be told that in this moment, momentous moment of transition, that it ought to be abiding by certain obligations that attend to the semi-autonomous regions, the treatment of minorities, etc. The second threat is Russia, that similar to China, doesn't want to be constrained in any way by the uh, opprobrium, by the censure that comes from outside the Russian Federation. The third is the United States under President Trump. Uh, where do I begin here? <laughs> the administration has shown itself quite willing to push the human rights agenda in respect of a number of particular uh, files. Venezuela, uh, you have Myanmar, we have Iran, and in this context, they seem to be willing to work with the files. But, as we have seen, and I'll touch on this a little later on, there are a whole range of other issues where we see a backtracking, not least, of course, the US's withdrawal from the Human Rights Council doesn't speak volumes for its commitment to the universal agenda. Then we have a long list of authoritarian-minded leaders and populist demagogues, and alas, the list is very long, from Erdogan to Sisi to Duterte, Bolsonaro, Maduro, Mohammed bin Salman, Orban, it's a very long list. Five, we have the takfiris from the Islamic world who attack the foundations of universal rights and are prompted by hate-filled, poisonous ideologies. And then we have the white supremacists who want to rid the world of all Muslims in no, in no small measure as a reaction to the barbarity of the takfiris. There is a question I'm often asked, why do I position these extremist tendencies after the states that I mentioned earlier. The feeling that we have in the human rights community is that while terrorists and extremists can make a huge dent in our lives, can bring violence to our lives in the most despicable way, they are not going to destroy this planet. It is the states that will do that. The states that have done that in the past or got us very close to that and that will do that. It's not these groups. Seven, we have the conservatives throughout the world, social and religious, determined to undo parts of the universal rights agenda. Eight, we also have leading academics who question the effectiveness of the human rights agenda without offering any clear alternatives. And nine, we have the economic elites who also see the agenda as threatening and I have touched upon their use of euphemistic language. This evening I propose not to go into all of the aforementioned in detail, but to take a, a little bit of a more philosophical approach. When I teach my course at uh, Penn Law, the first question that I ask the students, and they are uh, 
JD and LLM students, the first question I ask them is, why do you think we need law? And I'm not speaking here of law in, along a narrow remit, tax law, housing law, or contracts as such, but the sort of higher law, the Uskogan's norms. Why do we need it? And here we sort of, have, one has to think about the prohibitions on genocide and torture, piracy, war crimes. Surely our record of persistent human suffering in many parts of the world, along with the human brain, its computing to the point of reason, or to make it abundantly clear to all of us where the boundaries of human action should exist. So why do we need law? These laws, the whole corpus of law, why do we need to insist that they be abided by? And the students look at me a little bit like uh, the way you're looking at me now. <laughs> and I would say to them, is it not simply, ladies and gentlemen, because we also acknowledge just how primitive we still are. We're just too untrustworthy, huh? too unreliable, too lacking in any faith in ourselves. We need to be encaged in law, and for good reason. And many of you would have read uh, Christopher Browning's uh, book, Ordinary Men, uh, that he published in 1992, which describes how an otherwise peaceful you know, community in a number of different settings can and do and will act savagely in the context of unusual circumstances. And they may even enjoy doing so. Once the bars holding up the cage are loosened and are stretched, we are then let loose and we begin to feast on one another. We know this and without laws, without a respect for human rights, well, we ought to recall the first line of the second draft of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, the so-called Kassan draft. After all, the pathetic and terrifying consequences of their absence, the absence of human rights, almost destroyed uh, René Kassan's generation. The first line of the Kassan draft of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights reads as follows. Considering that ignorance and contempt of human rights have been among the principal causes of sufferings of humanity. Ignorance and contempt of human rights among the principal threats to humanity. Now, Kassam, René Kassam suffered grievously from wounds he sustained in the First World War when he served as a French soldier, and he lost a large part of his family in the Shoah, I think 15 members. He knew the devil of violence that slithers through all of us. And that is why we need law. That is why we need the Yuskogan's norms as they are codified in law. And yet, and yet there is another factor in play today because human rights law is being trapped in the fault line separating competing ideologies, both now unsheathed, if I were to divide the world into two. A liberal order grounded in positive and natural law and a more conservative one rejecting the former's more recent advances. So you may ask yourself, well, what is new in that? These standoffs are old. I would say, yes, they're old, but there is a new energy now that is of concern to us. And it all began with 9-11, fed by another ideology, an extremist ideology from within Islam, and I spoke of takfirism. And this takfirism after 9-11 went amok, and it was felt in many parts of the world. And there was a backlash then that began to develop in the West. And there was a confusion as to who these people were and the Islamic world sadly did very little to address it uh, them itself or themselves. And the counterterrorism that began to gather steam as a matter of government policy did the wrong thing because it wasn't focused on the ideology of takfirism itself, 
It was focused on individual terrorists. Still to this day, this is the case. And the broadest communities in general, Muslims in general. And it was failing to recognize that the first victims of takfirism or takfir uh, violence were other Muslims. And the counter-reaction by states, by and large, was military and security in its orientation. And they did not, these policies, solve the problem at its heart. Meanwhile, the spread of xenophobia and the anti-immigrant feeling in Europe, at least, was clearly in evidence, and the white supremacists were given a boost. Then when we add to this the 2008-2009 banking crisis, the home forfeitures, the austerity measures that were in place in many parts of Europe, and all the while generating the perception, at least, that the bankers and those responsible for the crisis were protected, were protected by an establishment irrespective of party, the accruing or developing anti-establishment feeling began to show itself. And with the rapid changes in technology in place and the fears that jobs would be lost in the future, uh, all of this was blended into a, a soup where extrapolations were then subsequently drawn of the most unusual kind. And I have to again stress these were extrapolations in the context of these fault lines that were becoming very clear. Fault lines on civil rights, abortion rights, the rights of the LGBTI. I'm intrigued by this soup because you see things that are reminiscent of past behavior. When I joined the faculty at uh, Penn, the law faculty, I became aware very quickly of a colleague on the faculty who was creating a stir by the name, her name is uh, uh, Amy Wax. She's a, a tenured professor, a legal scholar, and who was once also a neurologist. Almost two months ago, she addressed the National Conservatism Conference uh, in DC and said, and this is taken uh, from an interview published recently in The New Yorker. She said, and I quote, we are better off in our country if it is dominated numerically, geographically, politically, at least in fact, if not formally, by people from the West than by people from countries that had failed to advance. Our country, i.e. the US, will be better off with more whites than non-whites. Her argument that somehow culture, the superiority of one culture over another, uh, as borne out through empirical studies, uh, that also show itself in every day, that show themselves in, or let's say the, the feeling shows itself in everyday experience, the cleanliness of certain suburbs where the whites seem to live, as opposed to the slovenly neighborhoods in which other non-whites live, or let's say non-whites live, led her to believe and draw conclusions about who should be admitted into the US and who should be denied. And she even went to the extent of comparing the air investigation conducted by the Malaysian authorities in respect of Flight 370 that disappeared in 2014 over the Indian Ocean as demonstrative of this you know, cultural ineptitude that ought to disqualify people from Southeast Asia from coming to the US. When she's called a racist, she bristles, making the argument that there's no definition uh, of racism, uh, the same could be applied to terrorism, and she attacks the politically correct as a break imposed on the First Amendment, and she rebels against it, and she attacks politically correct speech as thought police, scripted, and uh, a tactic that smothers the otherwise naked and ugly truth. And she claims that those who do this uh, form the dictatorship of the left. Now, evidently, she doesn't seem to know that a world war and a genocide were prosecuted on the same basis, drawn from a belief by the leaders of the Nazi party that high culture and scientific success was evidence of moral superiority 
and provided a license for the promotion of racial superiority and the necessity of securing racial purity. I haven't spoken to Amy Wax yet. I doubt she'd want to really speak to me. And when I looked at the investigations by the Dutch authorities of the world's worst aviation accident in Tenerife in 1977, you know, it wasn't that very different from the way that the Malaysians behaved in respect of their aircraft. Now, true, international human rights law doesn't have a definition for terrorism, but it does for racial discrimination, and it's a good one. Article one of the International Covenant, uh, sorry, Article one of the International Convention uh, for the Elimination of Racial Discrimination defines racial discrimination in this way. Any distinction, exclusion, restriction, or preference based on race, color, descent, or national or ethnic origin, which has the effect of nullifying or impairing the recognition, enjoyment, or exercise on an equal footing of human rights and fundamental freedoms is racial discrimination. So discrimination on the basis of criterion beyond the control of the individual and national or ethnic origin is one such criteria cannot be grounds for exclusion. You cannot be punished. You cannot be punished, simply put, for something you have no control over. And why is it so hard for Amy Wax to understand this? Yet on the battlefields of competing ideologies, principles seem to disappear quite easily. Emotions eclipse reason expressed through law, and even if the latter has commanding value, because human rights law, international human rights law, treaty law, is after all the aggregate of human experience, the distillation of human experience. It wasn't as if at the end of the Second World War, with all the wreckage around them, lawyers with no other, basically with free time on their hands, just sat there and decided to, to codify these provisions. I mean, they understood after years of trial and error to devastating effect that unless we codify, uh, we would be in trouble again. So what emerged from natural law, customary law, into treaty and statutory law also, sadly, was basically appropriated by the left as the values over which it has special custodianship because it assumed more than civil and political rights. It also encapsulated social, economic, and cultural rights. And then, therefore, we had this problem where the right began to see the human rights agenda as a vehicle for the promotion of those parts of the left's agenda which, were, uh, which it was opposed to. And in the co contemporary debate, we speak of sexual and reproductive rights and the rights of the LGBTQ. And this is most evident in the countries of Central and South America, but not limited to them. There is also some truth to the allegation that ideologies have been created in such a way uh, or let's say have appropriated parts of the agenda in such a way that lead to suspicion and doubt. When I first uh, took over from my predecessor, it was noticeable in my office that there was a tendency to attack a right-wing leaning or right-leaning government if there were violations of human rights extending across the broad range uh, of uh, rights uh, obligations than if the government was left-leaning. Um, I once had an ambassador from Brazil who came to me who was indignant, and this is during the Temer government, uh, government um, and she said, you know, you, your office has put out, I don't know how many statements on Brazil, and look how many statements you've put out on Venezuela. We did do uh, a lot on Venezuela, but I had to concede that there was some problem here in terms of perception. But it is also wrong, I think, in the broader scheme of things, to believe that human rights is a pet of the left, that the obligations and standards set out in these treaties establish a frame that is applicable to all. Now, those who do not want to be questioned or contained on 
the issue of rights, and I've mentioned China earlier, such as China and Russia, of course, will fight it. I saw this most uh, clearly and starkly when two years ago I was invited to address the Security Council on Syria. It was a Friday. I was contacted by the French ambassador, and he said, uh, Zaid, will you come to the Security Council on Monday and brief us on Syria? So I spoke to my staff. I said, we're in the council on Monday. Please prepare the notes. And then on Monday, we went over the notes. I went over to the Security Council chamber, spoke to the president, uh, who was the ambassador from the Netherlands, and he said to me, look, we may have a, a small hitch. The Russians may call for a vote, and if it's a procedural request, there is no uh, threat of a veto being used, but we will need nine votes to have you speak, nine out of 15. Because I had served on the Security Council, I knew what the procedure was. So he said to me, you know, if you could sit on the side and once we get through the vote, I'll call you to speak and you come and address the Security Council. So I said very well. So I sat on the, by the side of the chamber and I was looking through my notes and the vote was called and we didn't get nine votes. We got eight votes. Uh, and what was so amazing is that the combined influence of the U.S., the UK, France, Sweden, the Netherlands was not enough to sway four other countries to vote uh, for a briefing on the human rights situation in, in Syria. So I left the, the hall and I went back to the office and eventually I, I spoke to the press. And I was rather cynical and I said, if we're not allowed to brief the Security Council on the human rights violations in Syria. <laughs> what on earth are we talking about in the Security Council when it comes to Syria? What, some arts and crafts fair in Damascus recently? I mean, it's unbelievable. And yet, this is what those countries who are clawing for room in which to conduct their policies or um, implement their policies free of any pressure are seeking to do. And expediency, as I've just mentioned, if it is the love interests of those who want to wield power, it was more than amply demonstrated when uh, the Rohingya were driven out in, en masse from northern Rakhine in um, September, or let's say August and September 2017, beginning in October of the previous year. What was dramatic about that was that 400,000 people were removed in very short order. Many were burnt in their homes. And there was an ASEAN conference soon thereafter where not one leader, not one leader, mentioned the word Rohingya in the public speeches. And what was clear to me, just like uh, Mussolini's invasion of Abyssinia in 1935, is that if you don't have a reaction, a strong reaction, then what message are you sending, not just to the Rohingya, but to others who understand that you can do these sorts of things free of any possibility of reaction? And what are we st setting ourselves up for in the future? When I reached the point where I w tended to attack almost everyone, um, mainly authoritarian, authoritarian-minded uh, populists and um, those who are uh, clearly dictators, I was told that I was wrong to lump them all into one group. I was told the first are unelected, the uh, dictators are unelected. The second are elected but behave with little uh, regard to the separation of powers and independence of other branches of government, especially ju the judiciary. And the third seem to manipulate on the back of half lies, but they're not all the same. I beg to differ because I felt what many felt, that they were harking back to a yesteryear, uh, the, the positing of some utopia which never really existed in fact. Europe, for centuries, was, was pillaged 
and burned, cities and towns destroyed. The idea that racial purity would take you back to some halcyon past was some form of chicanery at work in the minds of the, the, uh, in the minds of the demagogues. And so it felt right for, uh, for me to sort of lump them into one because there was this feeling, and I mentioned it earlier today, that they understood something that others understood earlier in human history. When Karl Weger, the infamous mayor of Vienna, a very sophisticated uh, man, a very sophisticated mayor, began to turn the anti-Semitism that was present in the Austro-Hungarian Empire in the 1890s into something far more virulent. He was asked by a journalist, well, you have Jewish friends. How could you do this? And his response was fairly clear. He said, well, I determine who my friends are. What he was trying to also convey was that the political dividend that accrues from attacking a particular minority in given circumstances is so great that you simply cannot pass it up, even if your friends are from that group. In the post-war year period, I think the Adenauer generation understood that if you do that, the consequences are catastrophic. And yet over the last 20 years or so, we've seen third-rate politicians, I mean almost sort of cartoonish characters, right, decide to pick up Tolkien's ring essentially to go into the areas of human experience which were forbidden, not by dint of treaty, but because we understood, we had the, the basic understanding of where this would lead, and yet undeterred, they've gone back, picked this ring up, and started hurling abuse at partic particular communities. And it has yielded dividends. I mean, that's the sad story here. It has yielded dividends. The, the, the import of it is, though, when you start a, a chauvinistic nationalism and fuel it to a point where it reaches a certain pitch, I have yet to be told in a way that's satisfactory how you can easily diffuse it unless you have conflict, unless you're prepared to take it to that stage. And this is where I think, in part, we are now. Also, it is remarkable to see that the numbers of people on the move around the planet today, all of them, so all migrants, you know, refugees, if we were to roll all of them into one figure, it's 4.5% of the global population. Nine, so 955 are static. And yet we see all this hysteria, this sort of madness, as if everyone's on the move, when everyone more or less isn't. And when you add to this the combi combined pressure that exists on the international system and the inability of the, this system to solve the crises in the DRC, in Yemen, in Syria, in Libya, uh, Palestine, Israel, Kashmir, Venezuela, Colombia. And yes, these are all complex issues. Most of them, of them rooted in, in human rights issues as well. It's not, though, impossible to conceive of how they could be sorted out if only we had exceptional leaders, if only we had. There are 190 foreign ministers around today. If I were to, to say to you, could you name me 20 who we could all agree were gifted, steeped in knowledge of history, in law, and economics recognizable for articulating a global vision. We're 7.6 billion people on this planet. Right? So I'm only asking for 20, right? that we can all agree, stand above everyone else in terms of their talents. Can anyone name 20? And then everyone gives me this sort of look. So I say, OK, 20 is too, too difficult. What about 10? 10 out of 193, and I continue to experience the silence, right? And this 
is the source of our problems. You know? How can we solve our problems if we're electing, appointing, or approving people that are fundamentally mediocre, that don't generate the sort of response that you'd like to see? Yes, the vast majority are not that competent, but at least we have 10 where we can pin our hopes, or we can pin our hopes on them. They will help us solve these crises. They will mold the agenda. They will force the discussion. They will articulate a global good. I'm really depressing you now. I can see it on your faces. <laughs> so what do we do? How do we get out of this? Well, I think we in the human rights community, we do need more or deeper self-examination. We need to be less preachy. We need to be more humble. In my office, we used to have, and I have to think, I don't want to insult them, but we used to have quite a few human rights mullahs, as we would say. These were human rights fundamentalists in the sense that they would say to me, Hi Commissioner, all you need to do is just repeat what is written in the specific convention, in the treaty. You don't have to think about various stratagems to get them to agree. Just say what it is that you have in the, in, um, the treaty. So I, I, in the beginning, did this. I was sitting with the Attorney General of a Pacific Island, and I had a long list of issues that they needed to address. And as I began to go through the, the, the list, the fellow opposite me was almost in tears. He was almost, uh, he, had, he didn't know how to respond. And I felt ashamed because he said to me, you know, we have no money. And then he explained the background. And I had to agree that we were sort of literalists. We were fundamentalists. What we were saying is fundamentally correct. They had an obligation to report on these issues. But I didn't take the contextual element on board in the way that I should have. And I needed to, and I think more in the human rights community ought to, but not for the sake or not at the cost of compromising on the principles. I was told the other day, someone said, you know, you need to be more compromising. And I said, there are a lot of people who compromise. There are a lot of institutions that compromise. Someone has to stick to the obligations. So I would say strategically, that's absolutely correct. But tactically, one can be more nuanced in the way that one understands the problems of a, of a, of a given context. Second, we need to all be inspired by the extraordinary courage of the human rights uh, defenders, the frontline defenders. Early on in my time as High Commissioner, I was sitting with a fellow from Bangladesh. He headed a, a not-for-profit organization. He came to see me with his two children. He'd been in and out of uh, detention pretty much his entire um, adult life. And I said to him, look, uh, the next time you publish something or write something, you could go in and you could, you, we may never see you again. Your family may never see you again. And are you still willing to do that? And he said, yes. And he did. And it is amazing when you think about it. Absolutely amazing. I was sitting with a young student from Nicaragua, from the University of Managua, one of the protest leaders. He came to see me in, in Geneva, amazing fellow. And uh, I said to him, why don't you stay in Geneva a few uh, weeks longer? If you go back now, they will detain you, and goodness knows what they'll do to you. And he still went back. He still went back, and they did detain him. And I, I fear for what's happening to him, that you have people with this enormous courage. And this is leadership. This is leadership. Not what we see on the political stage in so many countries, you know, selfish, sort of craven politicians who were not willing to give up anything for the sake of principle. At a grassroots level, it's a very different picture. When you look at, see what's happening in Hong Kong, it is quite extraordinary how brilliant the organizers are. And brilliant. And the more you look at it, the more you think about it, it is exceptional. And we see now broad pushbacks from countries, from 
across the world, whether Chile, Ecuador, Lebanon, Iraq, reactions against either demagogic behavior or the failure of the state to protect its most vulnerable. And this is a, a point that I'd like to dwell on just for a moment. When I used to visit countries, I used to put in my mind three sort of basic questions that I had to sort of answer during the course of a visit. Does the country suffer from systemic or systematic discrimination of a certain people? Is there structural discrimination in the country? And in almost every country there is. The second question, is there deprivation largely riding on the back of that discrimination, a deprivation of uh, legal and social protections and services? Also something I saw in evidence in most countries. And third, does the country re rely or uh, function on the basis of fear? And those are the three points that if I felt were satisfied, we would have good governance in the countries that we would look at. But the current climate, the way that the tensions have grown so quickly, and I go back to what it is the Takfiris were uh, up to in the years after 9-11, the reactions against Amy Wax's comments, what we see happening in this country. And you might feel that somehow we will overcome this. But I can tell you, two years ago, when I spent a, a week in Silicon Valley, followed by, by a trip to Libya, and Libya at the time was lawless. I mean, it still is. Uh, we flew in in the morning, we did our trip, and visited various places, places of detention, and then we were out. It was so violent that the UN didn't have a presence there. And yet the thought occurred to me that the distance separating Silicon Valley from Libya is really not that great. It's actually much closer than you think. And somehow the idea that we can just get through all our problems by dint of some technological wizardry is mistaken because it creates a reliance which if it's pulled away from under us, where are we then? Where will we be? not just in the US, but in many parts of the world. So the Universal Declaration may be humanity moaning from pain, but also it is a, de a document that searches for something better. And in the words of P.C. Chang, this remarkable Chinese professor who was decisive, played a decisive role in its articulation, the basic premise behind it is that we create a better human being from it. And that rights are not the product or the, um, the monopoly of one particular country or one particular state. That rights in every sense are universal. I mentioned earlier that wherever I traveled, and this was uh, an opinion that was shared with me and I agreed with it. Wherever I traveled, when I met with victims groups, the marginalized, the most poor, those in IDP camps, those who had suffered from the, the horrors of conflict, you always felt from listening to them that rights were universal. If you sat with their governments, or those who were trying to offer some sort of shelter to the perpetrator, then you began to hear that there were cultural variations that had to be taken into account. But I never heard it from the victims, never, in any country that I went to. So what we need to do on the human rights side is approach this with more self-control, precision in speech, not to over-exaggerate, because ultimately, the key to success it lies in the art of making small adjustments, not the adjustments that are now being spoken of, that we dispose of states altogether, that we rely on some sort of blockchain sovereignty. There's one idea that we dispense with elections altogether and just have 
legislatures appointed like juries. They are selected randomly and then appointed. I don't think any of that would work. What would work is if you had the young, the youthful components of society all take part in voting. And I would also favor the idea that people who are almost my age or slightly older basically be prevented from voting. <laughs> Our lives are almost done. It's your lives that uh, matter to us, it ought to, and you need to be in charge of this, not us. I also, when I think about the art of small adjustments, I l think back to my motorcycling days. So when I became, when I turned 46, I went straight headlong into a midlife crisis. <laughs> and, um, and I went to a motorcycle dealership and I got my leather jacket and I thought I was the coolest thing that ever existed. Uh, my wife said I looked, at, looked like an insect, basically, but <laughs> it, 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 didn't, it didn't deter me. Now, one of the lessons you learn from motorcycling, and, and many of you will also know this from cycling, is that if you're riding along and you see this giant pothole right in the middle of the street, now this may not be a common occurrence here in Ann Arbor, <laughs> <laughs> but in New York, they're everywhere, right? And if you see a pothole, if you look at the pothole, you're going to end up in it, right? It's one of these strange things, but if you look at either side of the pothole, that's where your bike will go. And similarly, one has to appreciate that we are a remarkable species, right? A remarkable species, because the central instinct we have is self-preservation. And yet the human rights defender is willing to override that instinct and push for social progress in a way that um, artificial general intelligence or will never be able to achieve because it doesn't come from a majority preference. When France banned the death penalty, there was still a majority opinion in favor of its retention. It can be said almost of every country that it's banned in. When you first had people agitate against a business model which was so successful, that of slavery, there were so many interests that were uh, arrayed against those who were deciding that it could no longer continue. And yet society changes because we're not that simple. We can overcome that instinct of self-preservation by sacrifice for the greater good. Not visiting violence in the way that some will do in protection of their narrow interests or their, their so-called people, but the broader interest. There is also some other, uh, one other anecdote I'd like to share with you. It's less an anecdote but a lesson that I picked up from the game of rugby. And I say this because the World Cup just ended and I've been watching a lot of it. But there's something about us as human beings where if we're on a winning streak, we don't really pay much attention to ourselves because a few or a handful of brilliant people can carry the rest of the team. But if we're on the defensive, then everyone, everyone has to be a leader. If you're on the goal line, and you're defending, and it's a critical game, and you're not putting in, e each one is not putting in their tackle, the game is lost. And so I, I sort of have this sense that we're at a moment where it's a bare-knuckled fight for rights. This shouldn't be viewed as something of a luxury, again, the weak force, of uh, something just for activists. Because I can tell you in many societies, in many societies, they are surprised when the rights begin to disappear, and they ought not to be. Do you know that to live, you need to inhale 22,000 times a day? Right? And no one ever thinks of it unless you're being strangled. And then you know if you're not drawing breath in the next two minutes, you're done. And sort of, rights are like oxygen. They're there if you don't think about it, you're not ensuring that it's going to continue to be there to dignify your life, you stand to lose. So in the end, my message to you, and especially the students, you have to believe me, and perhaps I can speak on behalf of the faculty here, we don't need bright people. We really don't. The world has never been short of smart people. We're not in need of smart people. 
We are in need of smart people with a deep conscience, smart people who are brave and smart people who are willing to self-sacrifice. Technicians, we have plenty of technicians. Trust me, we don't really need them. We do need them. <laughs> I don't want to put myself out of work. No, we do need them, but we need uh, also, and more to the point when we are hard pressed, we need people with a deep reservoir of ethical thinking and a conscience that will make a difference. Thank you for giving me a few moments of your time. Okay. So, I questions? Yes, sir. Or shall we go to the student first? Uh, thank you for the opportunity. You mentioned earlier about the role of United Nations as your previous experience. We knew that UN has authority but also limitations, whether it's a political power or budget resources. So based on your previous experience, what do you think are the priorities of reform in the United Nations to ensure and enhance its role in upholding human rights in the future? And you also mentioned about the good governance. In the global context, human rights often associate with democracy. Do you think democracy is a prerequisite for human rights? And what is your opinion about monarchy and other political systems? Okay. Thank you. No, great questions. All right. I, I, I'll try and answer it in, in, in three ways. The first question is a, is a great question. Look, I always felt that the UN is only as great or as pathetic as the rest of the world is out there. And if the world is pathetic, the UN is pathetic. The UN is only an extension of the rest of the world. It's a reflection of the rest of the world. And it won't function if the system out there doesn't function. Now, I modify it just slightly by saying the UN, that is the UN of the member states. That's all the governments sitting there and arguing endlessly. And I used to be one of them, right? And I used to argue endlessly, <laughs> uh, much to the annoyance of my own family. But that is not the only UN. There is the Secretariat. There are all the professionals working in the field who risk life and limb to bring some sort of protection to people who are embattled and people who are suffering. And, that, and those are heroes. That part of the UN is heroic. And it's that part of the UN that needs to be supported more by the governments. But governments in general, you know, they're losing faith in a system that they created and at great cost and risk to themselves, because once the unraveling happens, and we know how fast it can happen, uh, there's very little to um, suggest that we can quickly erect a new architecture and it would stand as a, as, um, uh, a, a guarantee against uh, violence on a broad and, and massive scale. The last question, democracies and functioning democracies as opposed to democracies that are not functioning very well. It reminds me, and I would ask you to look at this interview that was conducted by the US uh, psychiatrist that was attached to the US delegation at Nuremberg, uh, Gustav Gilbert. And he conducted a very important interview with Hermann Goering before Goering committed suicide. And uh, Gilbert says to Goering, now Goering was a, a diabolical man, but he knew what he was talking about in this context. Gilbert said to him, how is it that you managed to amass power so quickly, you and the Nazi hierarchy? And he basically said, uh, well, so long as you can point to an external enemy that has a reflection internally inside your own system, and so long as you're able to uh, basically point to the disloyalty of those who do not support you in, and insinuate that they must therefore be with the enemy, you can turn any population around. So uh, Gilbert said to him, yes, but surely this is not the case in democracies. This may be the case in Germany after 1933, but not earlier. And Goering said, no, no, it's the case everywhere. Right. So clearly, the democratic system, the way that we conceive it in terms of all its check, checks and balances, if it w operates properly, 
then the rights in, uh, of, of its citizens, the rights of uh, the people of the country are more likely to be guaranteed and more likely to be honored. You know, the moment we began to see in Venezuela, for example, this was back in the days of Chavez before Maduro in 2008, 2009, there was clear penetration of the judiciary by the executive. At that stage, we knew that we were in trouble. In terms of the monarchic systems, I think they're all being forced to answer the questions that the population asks them. In other words, y there's a constant interview. If you're not serving us, if you're not assuring us the guarantees that we demand, if we're not part of the political process, if we're not sharing in the decision making, well then the historical legacy of, of uh, you know, what's happened to monarchies that they've disappeared over time will continue. And uh, my own family was very much connected to the Iraqi monarchy that uh, disappeared in 1958. And that probably is the way that most monarchies will go in the next 100 years. First of all, thank you for your very knowledgeable and fairly terrifying and ultimately uplifting talk. I think it was <laughs> wonderful. So I have, a, I have a, a different way of conceptualizing the threats. Just my feel is environmental human rights, and, and I would argue that climate change sort of embraces all those threats and also incorporates all those national leaders who are running away as fast as possible from facing this threat. So I have a little bit of an optimistic uh, take on it, though. I was at a conference a few weeks ago in Sweden that was on environmental rights and climate change, and uh, I was one of the few Americans, so I took it on the chin quite a bit uh, because of our national leader. But one of the things that really came out that was so interesting is that if you just look at the United States, President Trump just walked away this week from Paris, finally. But it's also the case that there are 18 states in this country and 750 cities and towns, including Ann Arbor and Grand Rapids, Ranfra, that have declared themselves formally uh, supportive of the Paris Agreements and declared themselves sustainability cities or states. Um, there's hundreds, thousands of, of American companies and corporations that are triple bottom line uh, businesses that include sustainability as part of their definition yeah. of what profit means. So on the one hand, I agree with you that we're suffering through a, a pretty lean time when it comes to human rights leadership around the world. But I also think, and, and when Keo gave his talk a, cu a couple months ago about how rights make might, it has to do with people in social movements and below the leadership level who really know how to incorporate human rights into social change. So I'm wondering if you see some hope in, in those, kinds of, those kinds of movements. Yeah. We had, a, a now that I've spoken about, uh, sort of spoken ill about the older generation, I must confess that I, I've, uh, I've been invited to join the elders, and I've, I've agreed uh, as the sort of representative of the militant youth wing of the, of the elders. But we had a discussion about, um, about uh, geoengineering and the fact that there doesn't seem to be any deep discussion on setting up a regulatory framework because the opinion of most, at least, who know about these issues, and I'm sure you know much more than the rest of us, is that this is going to, ha this is going to happen and we need to put a regulatory framework up there because there has to be a discussion on the moral, ethical sort of, uh, you know, components of this. Otherwise, people with no voice will be made to suffer because others want relief, or all of us, I should say, want relief from rising global temperatures. But the idea that we can just leave it to some potential, or let's say a billionaire somewhere, to s resolve the problem for us but set off a whole cascade of other um, issues, I think is something that we need to pause and think about. But I do agree. I mean, we, that's why I said we're in a bare-knuckled fight for the planet at the moment. You can either sit and watch or you can participate. But either way, you're going to be affected. You know, and let's hope you're affected in a way that's positive, that we can sort of somehow put this planet on the right trajectory. I mean, the way I, I conceive of it is this way. And this is a, fa a fairly simplistic way of looking at it, that the globe is a ship and each country has a cabin. And all of us are t tending to our cabins, no matter how 
uh, effective or not. And you hope that in time you would go from, if you are a low middle income country, that you'd become a middle income country and you can move from you know, somewhere lower decks to a, a higher deck. And the, the leading countries of the, of the planet, the greatest economies, are up in the staterooms. Right? And we all talk about where we can be relative to each other on the decks of the ship. But the, the need for a deep discussion on the, the, the trajectory we're taking as a planet, that is where we seem to fail. Now, there are two problems here. One is that we do have the fora for discussions. But as you very well know, much of the, what is being said is mechanical. People are restating old positions, and we don't have the genuineness that we need to see. And then you expect that the genuineness actually occurs in the private meetings. You know, uh, three or four heads of state sitting together, you know, a group of ministers sitting together. From what I can see, that does not happen. And we have this wayward drift led by a short-term sort of, you know, inclination. And, and the voices that need to develop in density to change this have yet to emerge. Because when I look at the environmental movement, if I can be just be slightly controversial here, when I look at the, the different uh, conventions in place, the Biodiversity Convention, for instance, uh, most of the language is we encourage, uh, or if there's a statement that goes out, they are concerned, you know, what's happening with the planet. I can tell you from the human rights perspective, that wouldn't be enough. From the human rights perspective, you go up to, I mean, what is the difference between a human rights person and a humanitarian person? Th the easiest way to conceptualize it is imagine a bully in a schoolyard beating up younger children. And the humanitarians will rush in and will tend to the children lying on the ground. Yeah? The human rights people will go up to the, to the bully and you're putting your finger on their chest and you're pushing them back. Direct confrontation. Uh, nothing less. The environmental movement, I think, is somewhere in between there. It hasn't got to the point beyond the indigenous leaders, and you see in many parts of uh, South America that are risking their lives daily uh, in defense of their communities, in defense of the, the uh, ecosystems in which, which they inhabit, and which for which they have really quite amazing, you know, um, remedies, if, if you will. But they are by, by and large on their own. And when I look at the records of uh, the discussions at meetings, they're just not of the gravity and severity and tone that you need. I mean, we really need to hold these governments to the mark and say to them, what are you doing? I mean, I, I, let me share with you something that's mildly controversial. I, I could get into huge trouble here because I haven't seen it. But when Greta Thunberg came to the UN in September, she dominated the media, sort of, um, the media emerging from the UN, because what she said, I think, expressed the feeling of so many people. Right? It was raw, it was emotional. I mean, it was amazing. I heard word that inside the UN, they were quite upset, because she basically stole the thunder of the UN, that it wasn't focused on all the statements of ministers. Well, it wasn't focused on all the statements of ministers because the ministers were not speaking in a way that's recognizable to most human beings. But what Greta was doing was doing the right thing. I mean, this is, this is what we want. And if I could be, uh, if now that I've joined the world of academe, if I could be also controversial here, when I would sit with colleagues in, who are you know, highly respected professors, <coughs> tenured, with First Amendment protections, why are they not speaking out more? I mean, in public fora. I mean, it is hard to go on Fox News and to be you know, attacked left or right and so forth. But there is, this profession is under attack. In the eyes of some, everyone here is an elitist undeserving of respect, uh, self-important. The fact that everyone's worked you know, damn hard to get where they are is something irrelevant. But I don't see the profession defending itself in the way it should. 
be defending itself. And, and we need to see more of that. But I mean, I, I share it. I'm as guilty as everyone. Mm-hmm. So I don't mean to pick on you, Professor. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, please, yeah, yeah. Oh, you, mm. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, you, you can go on, the, it's, it's fine. Mm. Um, hi, I'm a law student from Egypt, um, and I have a question. In 2004, um, there was an Arab Charter on Human Rights adopted by the Council. 2014, there was um, an Arab Court of Human Rights in the United Republic. Um, and there seemed to be this thrust towards uh, creating a regional uh, human rights regime. But nowadays, this is regressing. And, and no sane lawyer would ever make a human rights argument in an Arab court. What do you think is needed for human rights to be adopted, like to give human rights this extra normative push in the Middle East? Um, is it mere political will? Is it institutional reform? Is it? cultural change, in your opinion, what is needed to, to, to adopt human rights in the region in, in a way that yeah, is understood it's, everywhere? Uh, it's all of the above. I mean, one of the central weaknesses of the court or the, the, the basis by which, on which the, the court was um, or the anchored was that there was no right to individual petition. And so long as that didn't exist, then there was no, so it didn't, no one felt that this was going to be a serious sort of mechanism for addressing the human rights uh, violations in the Arab world. I think, I, I mean, you know, again, we go back to this fear of a questioning of legitimacy. Yeah? And if you're a human rights person, you're in that space. You're saying to a, a government, look, you have your constitution. You have your, the relevant provisions of the treaties to which you have bound yourself. You know, why are you not doing your job? Why are these people still deprived of their rights? Why don't you say uh, that you have defaulted clearly when you have? No one wants to be told that. But rather than do the right thing and reform in a way that's deep, we go to public relations and marketing and uh, you know, putting, uh, getting I don't know how many firms to do a sort of an improved, you know, give, your, give an improved version of, of vision of the Arab world. I mean, I had this, at one stage, I was chairing the, uh, uh, we call it Majlis Sufara al-Arab, the, the, the uh, group of Arab ambassadors in Washington. And the Iraqi ambassador, uh, no, sorry, the, the ambassador of the Arab League said to the rest of us, we need to go on a campaign in the U.S., we need to visit every city, speak to the media, and give a better v- impression of the Arab world than is currently being given. And so everyone started giggling. Uh, the Iraqi ambassador, very fine man, raised his hand and said, you know, how on earth <laughs> can we give an improved, uh, an improved vision or an improved perspective of the Arab world when we all recognize how deep the problems are and how severe the violations are? And I think that's, that's what we need to recognize, that you can't just... O- mask it through public relations campaigns. You know, there was a, a time when uh, I called up the Egyptian ambassador in, in Geneva because a number of, of uh, teenagers were arrested in Cairo for saying something against the president in public. And I, I said half-jokingly in the beginning, I said, that, but this is part of Egyptian culture. Everyone jokes about the president. I mean, when has it ever not been like this? But I then went into a more serious point. I said, you know, there are two things that you do when you do this. One is that you give the impression that you're so weak because if a handful of teenagers are threatening the national security of Egypt, then you're in uh, considerable trouble. But two, for everyone that you arrest arbitrarily, but in actual fact, there is no violation of a a criminal provision, let's say. You turn them and the families against the state because a manifest injustice has been done and how does that help you with long-term security and these are the issues that with which we have to deal I mean, it's very sad I mean what we are seeing now in the Arab world is sad but you begin to see again that the energies of the Arab Spring are there and you look at the uh, 
at uh, Lebanon, I think what's happening, and I'm, I haven't seen any analysis, but I think they look at a country like Tunis, or Tunisia, now successive transitions of power with problems, but seemingly doing quite well. They have a very strong civil society there. And so yes, an Arab country that tries to reform or be pushed to reform may end up like Syria, Yemen, or Libya, but it may also end up like Tunisia. And it doesn't seem to deter or daunt the, the Lebanese protesters. The long shadow of the civil war is not affecting them because perhaps they also feel that they, in the Tunisian example, there's hope of where a country can go and how a country can go through transitions. And it doesn't have to all be like Syria or Yemen. Thank you. Sorry, I have to be told to stop talking <laughs> when if we've exceeded our time. Um, uh, so you talked about mediocre leaders across the world being a major problem and maybe reason why we have the challenges we have today. And then you later discussed human rights defenders and other activists sort of as examples of real leadership. And I couldn't help but think of Aung San Suu Kyi, who stayed silent in the face of the Rohingya crisis. So I'm wondering... Um, why you're confident, how can we ensure that we end up with a Nelson Mandela and not a Daniel Ortega, a Robert Mugabe, a silent Aung San Suu Kyi? Or is it better for my generation to sort of issue relying on these leaders and these member state only for it to get things solved? Yeah, I mean, it's a, it's a really good question. You, you sort of expect that people who've been themselves detained uh, you know, in, in Kurunziza, for instance, in Burundi, or Mugabe when he was still, uh, when he was younger, uh, or Aung San Suu Kyi, that they understand what a deprivation of liberty means in the context of an arbitrary detention, and and that they would react very much in the opposite direction. I I don't have a simple answer for that because I it's almost inexplicable. I know that Jared was her counsel to Aung San Suu Kyi, so you should, tomorrow he's speaking, so you know, pepper him with this question. Um, because it is difficult, it is difficult. You know, there was this telling moment. Uh, so in October of 2016, there was an, uh, a, a border post, an army post, that was attacked, uh, and it was said that the ARSA group attached to the Rohingya was behind it. And uh, so there was a, a very violent reaction by the Tatmad, or by the by the Burmese military. And, uh, and uh, I called up Aung San Suu Kyi and I said, I, needed, I need to send a team into northern Rakhine right away. And she said, uh, give me some time to think about it and I'll get back to you. In the meantime, she went to Singapore. And I don't know if you've ever seen this. I think it's still on YouTube, but she's on the stage there. And she's asked by someone, well, what about the Rohingya? And she sort of laughs almost derisively. And she says something like, well, you know, this is a fabrication, a uh, fabrication from the outside. And immediately it struck me that, that, you know, she could have said, look, I'm not going to go deep into this issue, but we share a common space in this part of the world. Whether we like it or, no or not, we're somehow linked by history, and we need to think and care for all the people within this geography. Uh, she could have spoken in a stateswoman-like way, instead of just saying fabrications. And what I found was inexcusable was she ended up becoming the spokesperson for the military. She could have stayed silent. If she disapproved, she could have stayed silent. I think sadly, as the late Kofi Annan said at one stage, we were hoping for a stateswoman, and we ended up with a local politician. That's uh, the sad reality of it. Yeah. So in the interest of time, we'll take a few questions at a time. So. Hi, uh, thank you very much for your excellent talk. Um, my question is about when you were a high commissioner for the United Nations for refugees. Um, I know that one of the basic principles in refugee law is non refoulement Don't send people back to the places where they're trying to escape from uh, because it's inhuman. Uh, but it happens all the time, and governments do it all the time. Uh, the United States itself had, for 20 years, a policy called wet foot, dry foot policy that sent people found in tiny little boats at sea back to Cuba, where they were trying to leave from. Um, so as when you were commissioner, 
for refugees at the United Nations. What could you do other than to say, but you signed this agreement that says that you accept non refoulement uh, principles, but you are violating them. I mean, what, what else, what other forms of power did you have? Well, yeah, no, it's a good question. Uh, one is that I, I was not the High Commissioner for Refugees, but for Human Rights. And so there was there is someone, a colleague, who's, who does that. But we were active on refoulement, because not only is it a, a sort of key part of refugee law, but also it, it's a key part of uh, human rights law in the context of the Convention Against Torture. Um, it is the one provision that, as you rightly pointed out, many, many countries tend to violate, that there are grounds for believing that the person or individual returned to their state of origin uh, will be uh, subject to torture and other inhumane acts, and yet the country concerned will still send that person back. It is true. I mean, we have to constantly be vigilant, and we have to call it out for what it is. And, um, and we have a weapon in the sense that we have the international media with us. Um, we used to rely also on a number of countries, the sort of the sentinel states in Europe. I mean, Europe gave us two world wars, essentially. And as, uh, you know, uh, in return, it, it played a, a key role in the architecture of the human rights machinery. And this uh, role where they would uh, sort of a a assist and provide support for has slowly been eroding because you've had these uh, populist leaders coming into, into power and then adjusting the way in which countries would deal with these issues. So, you know, Italy for uh, some considerable amount of time was doing the right thing, then it went uh, started doing the wrong thing. We saw Greece start off doing the wrong thing, then doing the right thing, then doing the wrong thing again. And it depends very much on the political winds. But ultimately, the, 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 the cautionary tale here is that, again, if only 4.5% of the people on this globe are moving, you know, and we were to become a mean-spirited, mean-minded international community, you know, don't try and cross the border. You die in your home because no one is going to support your claims when you come out. And if anything, you'd be persecuted by a government acting on the whim of populist leadership. And that is unfortunately where we're going unless we change the trajectory. It's die in your home and don't try and leave. Um, so we, the, the stakes are very grave. Um, in the end, you know, in the end, you have no respect, I think in any particular profession, for keeping your silence. I don't think I've ever heard someone write a biography about someone who, you know, kept a vow of silence unless they were articulating some view in defense of, of the rights of all. And non-violently, of course. You know, so the voice has to be there. I was asked by a group of students um, in London last year, they said, uh, because you go to all these you know, young global leader type events, and they would say, what do we have to do to, to be a leader? And I would say, the only thing you need to do is shed fear. Have the basic components of knowledge and shed fear. It's amazing how few people can actually do it. But if you can do it, if you can be a Greta Thunberg, after all, what separates her from any other 15-year-old? Uh, I mean, it's, it's amazing how much power can exist in the minds of those that decide to actually begin to speak. And, uh, and then continue to speak, notwithstanding all the threats that you receive. Yeah. We'll take the last three questions. Hi. Thank you so much for coming out. It's an honor to have you here. Um, I have two questions based on um, experience volunteering with a refugee resettlement organization. Um, the first one is uh, about how UNHCR makes, uh, sets, sets priorities in terms of um, allocating funds and resources towards uh, making life more amenable um, or, or more comfortable for refugees um, 
once they arrive in their first um, country where, where yeah. they are refugees uh, versus resettling, um, how is that, like, what, what is the decision-making procedure look like in terms of um, prioritizing resettlement versus making life more comfortable for the people who arrive in, in for example, Jordan or Lebanon? Um, and then the second is based on um, experience conducting interviews with Syrian refugees in Jordan. Um, there are, are fears that are rampant among that community regarding uh, forcible return to Syria. Um, and I am interested to know what are some of the steps that the Jordanian monarchy has taken over the course of the past few years to uh, ensure that forcible return um, is not undertaken um, and, and to convey knowledge of rights to the members of that community. Yeah, no, the, okay. okay. Thank you also for um, coming tonight. It really is an honor and thank you for your authenticity uh, in this grave yet inspiring lecture. Um, you spoke that when speaking about human rights, there is a, a need to take into account the context um, while not at the cost of compromising human rights ideals and goals. And you also mentioned that the argument of cultural relativism is rarely, if not never, mentioned by victims of human rights violations. And I'd be interested in knowing more about if you, in, in your practice and experience, um, how do you see a, a tension between both um, and those two needs? and um, so the need of contextualizing yet not compromising, and how do you see maybe a risk in that, and um, how do you think we can best combine both? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, another another question. Uh, just follow up on the Egyptian uh, young man questions uh, in regard to human rights in general in Middle East, and you are being members of the Middle East. I don't know whether you are American or from Middle Eastern uh, descent, but I know that you are uh, of a Jordanian uh, from Al Al Maliki. Uh, my question is: I would like to uh, you to shed some light about the status of women as far as human rights uh, is concerned in the Arab world in general, and how you were perceived when you served as a a <laughs> uh, commissioner in the United Nations, how you were perceived by the Arabic government, and uh, what was the amount of pressure was on you in order to that comply with, but with whatever policy they uh, had? Thank you. You know, the, the question of pressure, I'll deal with that part, and then I'll go back to the other questions. Um, there was pressure, you feel, from government, and uh, my own government, uh, the government I used to represent, I mean, there were campaigns against me in the press that I was a traitor in the um, Akhirihi. But I can tell you that that pressure, and I think Jared and everyone working in human rights, and Professor, I'm sure it's the same with you, that pressure is uh, pales in comparison to the pressure you feel from victims' groups. Not that they put pressure on you, but you feel that you feel that no matter what you do to help them, emotionally you feel that it's never enough, and that you're inadequate in terms of addressing that. And I quite often used to come away. I mean, after a while, how many suffering Sy Syrian families can you meet? And what are you going to say that's different from what you said two months ago or a month ago? And I can go and do interviews, and I can do press conferences, uh, but I can't save the people who are still in, in detention, who are tortured, who are murdered, and so forth. And that pressure is far greater than the pressure that governments put on, on you. But I'll come back to that. Um, on the issue of the refugees, I mean, it's a great question. I wish I knew the answer to that because I never, I didn't work in refugees. You know, the, the High Commissioner for Refugees and the High Commissioner for Human Rights. So, so how those decisions are made are, are simply, they, they were never mine to make, and so I, I can't offer. On the forcible returns, I mean, I, it's true I do come from the sort of the, uh, 
the fringes of the royal family in, in Jordan. But I have no association with Jordan now, and for many years there was no discussion. I'm not really that welcome uh, back in the country, going back to the point that, that you, were, you were raising. It's simp uh, simply that, you know, in the Arab frame of mind, you don't criticize your own. But how on earth can you have any credibility with anyone <laughs> if you're not prepared to say that what we have you know, in the Arab world requires you know, a great amount of attention, and not least because we all know what the problems are. Um, but forcible returns, I, I assume and I hope they never think, imagine that they can do this. You know, it would be criminal. It would be criminal if they do it. And, they, and Jordan is a state party to the International Criminal Court as well. Um, in terms of the contextualizing, I, I was thinking, you're absolutely right, it's, it's, you have to approach it in a rather sort of subtle, uh, sort of, not subtle way, but, uh, but supple way perhaps. When I went to see the now deceased uh, president of Tunisia, and I had a long list of things that I needed to raise with him, uh, persistent reports of torture in the Tunisian jails, and the Tunisian places of detention, he said to me, have you looked at our economic uh, picture, the macroeconomic picture? And I said to Mr. President, I really haven't. He said, you need to look at it. And then tell me how I can address this issue. Help me address it from that perspective as well. And then I had to admit that in my office, I didn't have economists. I didn't have sociologists. That what we were saying is essentially right because it came from the families, it came from uh, Tunisian civil society. But at a tactical level, I had to have a, a better appreciation, a more sophisticated appreciation. I would still raise the points that we heard, had heard and received persistent reports of torture, even after the, the um, regime of uh, Zen Abidin. But it's, it's that sort of, sort of uh, contextualizing I was thinking of. I don't think we want to ever be in a position where we legitimize violations by an authority in any context. We don't want to be given that particular odious sort of uh, you know, uh, distinction, I should say. So you, you were always careful. You know, if we were going to train police, we'd have to be careful that they then didn't go and commit abuse and say, well, we were trained by the UN. You know, that sort of thing. You want to help, but you don't want to be instrumentalized by any, any side. Um, and then on, on the Arab world, yes, the, the pressure. Um, I think that there are many human rights defenders in the Arab world that are just amazing, amazing what they do. I mean, you know, Nabil Rajab in, uh, in Bahrain is in and out of prison. He comes out for a few days, he denounces, you know, and we had extensive discussions with all uh, Arab uh, governments. And I would say to them, I would say to them, help me help you. Saadouni asaidkum. If you're doing the right thing in human rights terms, I will highlight it. If you're not, I'm not going to stay quiet. You help me help you. And that's the basic philosophy that I adopted. Oh, uh, yeah, I mean, very complex, of course, because you can't look at the Arab world in one lens. You know, Tunisia is not the same as Lebanon or Jordan and they're not the same as the Gulf countries. And now where you put Saudi Arabia, I'm not sure, because it seems to be changing for very much in the right direction, but how much of this is going to be long-term? Can it be reversed? With uh, Mohammed bin Salman, we're not sure. Uh, you know, we thought that he was on the right trajectory in the beginning, then, then it went in a terrible direction. So we're, we're not sure. It's something that I think, but I, in a number of Arab countries, civil society is quite powerful. And uh, again, I think if you look at why Tunisia worked, it's because they have a very powerful civil society, very impressive. And if you have that, that can help um, overcome these challenges when it comes to the rights of women, the rights of persons with disability. We have terrible racism in the Arab world, terrible racism, I mean, appalling treatment of minorities and so forth. So we have we have many issues. Allah yeah. Saidna. Thank you. <laughs> um, all right.